Greetings, folks, and welcome to a little digression into monstrosity. I realize this is supposed to be our first lecture on Tenant of Wildfell Hall, but the truth is I've just got some monstrous things on my mind. And as you are reading through the beginning of that wonderful novel, I thought I'd just share a few of my own thoughts on the monstrous as they pertain not just to the Brontes, or to the Gothic generally, but also to some of the other things we'll be reading. For example, Goblin Market and the Time Machine. As we move through today's little talk, I'll probably not refer very much to any of the specific texts on our syllabus. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions there. And just toss out some ideas that I think you might find useful and that I hope you'll find interesting. To start, we should probably say something about the notion of the uncanny, which of course is addressed quite famously by Freud in his essay by the same name, or Das Unheimlich, if you prefer it in German. Freud defines the uncanny as that class of the terrifying which leads back to something long known to us, once very familiar. That is, the uncanny for Freud or if you want a more literal translation of unheimlich, it would be unhomely, is simultaneously familiar and unfamiliar, and it's that simultaneity, that familiar unfamiliarity, that actually gives rise to our emotional, psychological, spiritual, and aesthetic discomfort in its presence. And the uncanny, of course, is important to any understanding of the Gothic. The uncanny is, of course, indispensable to the modern genre of the horror movie. For example, the fairly common motif of showing a human being walking or moving in a way that human beings don't generally walk or move, be it with an inversion of their joints or a particularly jerky motion. This produces, I think, and I say this as a lifelong fan of the genre, a really intense feeling of discomfort, of dread, of, of psychological revulsion because the thing isn't what it's supposed to be. That is, there's a category in our mind that we have, in this case of a human being, that the uncanny image simultaneously fits and warps or challenges. And it challenges it in such a way as to sort of throw it back in our faces as being something vulnerable. And that awareness of the vulnerability of our own basic perceptions, our own basic categories of thought, with which we navigate our very being in the world, is profoundly unsettling, I think. And here I'm going, I think, a little bit beyond Freud. I'm speaking simply about my own experience of the uncanny and my own thoughts on the subject. But if you wanted to anchor this a little more closely to what we're actually reading, I think one of the clearest examples I could draw on from our syllabus so far is Heathcliff. Heathcliff looks human. He, he presents as human. And if we're reading this as a realistic novel, he kind of has to be human. On the other hand, there are enough unknowns about him to leave us genuinely wondering. And we can even set aside his physicality right now, which we've already discussed in a colonial context, and simply take a look at his behavior. Heathcliff undoubtedly loves Kathy. In fact, the primary instance of love in the book is probably Heathcliff's love of Kathy. And yet, at the same time, his love comes across as monstrous to us, doesn't it? Because he goes beyond the boundaries that both Victorian society and our society hold as being acceptable. Edgar throws himself on Kathy's grave. Heathcliff climbs right down the fuck into it. And in doing so, he makes us aware of Edgar's and probably therefore our own limitations. Ways in which, on the one hand, he is excessive, but on the other, we may be deficient. Many lovers say they are absolutely devoted to their beloved, regardless of other considerations, but in Heathcliff, we get to see what that actually looks like. He claims he has done no injustice, as we discussed in the last lecture, 
And he does have a concept of justice. And his concept of justice actually is rooted in something that we can recognize. And yet the way he goes about it is sufficiently out of whack with the way we tend to think about justice that it comes across as monstrous. But it's not that far away from what most of us and most of what Bronte's society would have thought as being justice if they looked at the at their own source texts at their own source arguments closely enough in that sense as well I think the uncanny can show us something about ourselves and about our categories that often it's uncomfortable for us to see and acknowledge and sometimes even painful and sometimes I think our revulsion or rejection at the uncanny is exactly a revulsion and rejection of the challenge to our categories and our refusal to embrace that challenge, to push it away in revulsion instead of answering the question. Another notion that we should talk about, and this comes up a lot in the discourse on monsters, I can't pin it down to a single author as it's really kind of all over the place, is hybridity. This, of course, overlaps the uncanny quite a bit. To be a hybrid, of course, is to be a thing or creature of a mixed nature. And it's that mixedness that I really want to address because it's culturally problematic. And it comes with some really interesting and, I think, challenging assumptions. The most important, of course, is an assumed notion of purity. That is, an assumed notion of a non-hybrid state. And I think all cultures have some notion of purity of this kind. Some notion of an unadulterated cultural or racial or ideological or socioeconomic us against which everything else is a clear them or at least an unambiguous point of reference from which you can evaluate who's in who's out and the closer you are to that point of reference the more purely of us you are throughout much of the 19th century of course and throughout much of the modern period these notions of purity have revolved around race. I hardly need to tell you this. And there was, and in many cases remains, particularly among societies of European descent, a genuine anxiety about mixing with the racial other, about hybridizing the progeny, about maintaining the purity of the race. This was an active discourse in the 19th century particularly where there were theories taken seriously among the scientific community of the relative superiority and inferiority of the various supposed races. We see an example of this kind of thinking, for example, with Bertha Mason in Jane Eyre and her psychological instability, her, her sexual promiscuity, both of which are bound up with her mother's side of her ancestry, that is the Creole or mixed side of her ancestry, not the European side. And here we're edging from notions of racial purity and into notions of moral purity, aren't we? That is, it's the, the physicality and the sexuality of the racial other that is at least part of what makes Bertha Mason such an unsettling character. She brings into this English country home a mixed and uncontrolled nature that ultimately can't be contained and literally burns the place down. But that notion of purity itself is a power discourse, isn't it? It's bound up in the discourse of empire. It's bound up in the discourse of the slave trade. And in that sense, it has the sanction, the authority of institutional force to back it up. And I suppose on that note, it's worth pointing out that it's only within my lifetime that mixed race marriages have stopped being illegal in parts of, say, the United States. 
the fear of, well, the term used to be miscegenation, but the fear of hybridizing the races was sufficiently substantial to merit maintaining laws preventing it until very, very recently. And of course, the rise of white nationalism, not just in the United States, is bound up as well in that discourse of supposed purity and supposed hybridity, not recognizing, of course, that the construction of any pure state is itself a fiction, is itself a myth of identity that doesn't pre-exist any particular culture or any particular cultural norm, but rather is constructed and deployed in order to maintain it. Another way of looking at it, of course, is that monsters are creatures of borders. This is an idea largely explored by Jeffrey Cohen in his Seven Theses on Monster Culture. Cohen identifies the monster as a figure arising out of cultural anxiety, which is a very useful observation. And when we think about borders, of course, we don't need to just think about physical borders, do we? There are borders imagined or somewhat arbitrary lines between ideologies, species, races, genders, and any number of other categories whose crossing or whose ignoring arouses anxiety. We see a lot of examples of these anxieties in more explicitly Gothic narratives from the 19th century. For example, Frankenstein's monster or Bram Stoker's Dracula, depicting creatures who do things that being alive involves and yet whose ways of being alive or whose origins are other than being born. They make problematic the boundary, for example, between life and death, which is a difficult boundary to define in any case. Or, in the case of Frankenstein's monster, they make problematic the notion of discrete or integral being. The monster's consciousness arises from its complexity, it would seem, but we see that complexity assembled by human hands. This anxiety, of course, is carried forward in 20th and 21st century science fiction in the form of sentient computers, which are too numerous to name, or of androids, for instance, acting on human motivations and demanding the moral recognition accorded to human beings, generally speaking. A demand, quite frankly, that I find I have to recognize as legitimate. But at the risk of sounding condescending, and I really don't want to sound that way, I think I'll just draw you a picture. Okay, maybe not a picture per se, because drawing pictures is not one of my strong points, but at least a diagram. But a diagram of what, you may ask? And I guess one answer here is that this is a diagram of every word that's ever existed. That is, what we tend to do with our words, therefore with our labels, with our categories, because words are just markers of these, is to impose, for whatever reason, and the reasons vary, upon a field of effectively infinite potential, a border within which the meaning of the word or the content of the category is included, and outside of which the meaning of the word or the content of the category is excluded. There's nothing about the content of the category that necessarily demands that the boundary be drawn exactly where it is. The boundary itself is, to some degree, I think always, arbitrary. And this is simply how we communicate. It's arguably an intellectual, uh, a psychological necessity, the ability to draw boundaries between, for example, myself and not myself, between good and bad, between safe and dangerous. One example I often give when discussing the arbitrary nature of these boundaries is, is the rainbow or even a single color, for example, the color red. If I say red to you, you will think of a particular range of hues in the spectrum, 
that fit your understanding of what that word actually means, outside of which you will simply have a different label for a different color. But it's worth pointing out, I suppose, that the Old English word for red, red, covers all of the ground that we tend to mean by red, but it also covers other ground as well. It shades well into the orange range of the spectrum, for example, and also well into the purple range of the spectrum. It includes a number of shades that we would call rusty brown. Did they get red wrong? Did we get red wrong? And the answer, of course, is neither. They're both referring to something that is actually there, but they're calling it different things. Similarly, and here again, I have to make recourse to old English poetry. This is actually my area. The word yellow in old English, yellow, seems to include both all of what we mean by yellow and at one end, much of what we mean by orange, but is not covered by the Anglo-Saxon word for red. And on the other end, it seems to shade well into the green part of the spectrum. The sea, for example, is sometimes described as yellow in Old English poetry. Well, I've never seen a yellow sea, but I have seen a yellowish green sea. And we have to ask the same question here that we do with red. Are they right? Are we right? And the answer, of course, is neither and both. The labels do the job. Or, if we want to stick with the rainbow, depending on what school you went to, I suppose, as a kid, you will have learned that there are six or seven bands of color in the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple, which is the configuration that I learned as a child, or red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, which in fact is a configuration that we've only had since the days of Isaac Newton, who is the one who actually gave this particular configuration, because brilliant man though he was scientifically he thought there was some kind of mystical significance to the number seven and yet now many people when they look at the rainbow they see newton's seven bands of color not the six bands of color that would have been seen before both of which are of course entirely projections because there are no bands the rainbow is a gradient covering the entire range of visible light and containing no internal borders. And yet, when I look at the rainbow, having been brought up, having always understood the six-band configuration, I have to actually work to make myself see Newton's seven bands, even though I know that a large proportion of the world population sees those in a way that would seem to them to be instinctive, but in a way that, just as my own perception is, is in fact a cultural construct, a projection that's become so internalized as to seem natural and therefore is very difficult to challenge because it affects not only our categories of thought but the actual physical mechanisms of perception. But what does all this have to do with monsters? And I think the easiest way to answer that question is to give some clear labels to those variables of x inside the circle and not x outside the circle, so we'll call inside the circle us, and we'll call outside the circle them. And of course, as soon as I do this, your natural first question is going to be, that's nice, Roger, but what are your criteria? What is your us? What are your them? What the fuck are you talking about? And this, of course, is the best question you could ask. The answer is entirely irrelevant. That is, I could be talking about nationality, I could be talking about race, I could be talking about religion, I could be talking about gender, I could be talking about eye color, and I could be talking about people with and without stutters. It doesn't matter. What matters simply is that the boundary is drawn, and as I think I mentioned a minute ago, for the purposes of communication and for the purposes of thought, we do actually need those boundaries even though they are, as we're discussing now, problematic in a number of ways. But if this is a depiction of identity, schematically speaking, and in fact a depiction of every word that's ever been uttered, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, then where do monsters fit in? <laughs>
And the answer, of course, is that they fit in, as all genuinely interesting ideas do, problematically, only partially, and on the edges, on the border. The monster is monstrous precisely because it doesn't fit the category of us, but also because it doesn't fit the categories of them. It partakes of both. It straddles the border and thus identifies the border as a border, makes it apparent to us that we have drawn a line there between what is in, what is out, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. For example, with Edgar and Heathcliff, how close is it appropriate to get to your dead beloved? Or in the case of Frankenstein's monster, what actually does constitute an autonomous moral agent? Or looked at from another position, what constitutes an appropriate object of our empathy? That is, what constitutes a reasonable limit to where we draw a line around our moral community. Because monsters don't just straddle aesthetic and intellectual borders, they straddle moral borders. And I think that's one of the things that makes them unsettling. Because insofar as our us-them categories are always morally or ethically laden, monsters looked at in this regard challenge our morals, challenge our ethics. And here, rather than look at the obvious racial questions that are implicit in, for example, both Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights, I'd like to take a look at another issue with which our society is also currently wrestling, and that is the question of gender identity. Because this also, and I don't mean to say this in any negative or disparaging sense, is a monster discourse, by which I mean people in the trans community are often seen or often constructed, particularly at the conservative end of the spectrum, as in some way monstrous, which in turn places them sort of on the frontier of the moral circles, the moral boundaries that our society is in the process of negotiating or defining or redefining. Because, of course, it's the notion that these boundaries are in any way absolute, in any way non-arbitrary, that the monster challenges, that any border figure challenges. And if we take a look south of the border to political decisions made over the last few years in the U.S. regarding trans people serving in the military, we can actually see how this border is in the process of being negotiated and how trans people really are on the frontier. The Trump administration restricted trans people from serving openly in the military. The Biden administration rescinded that restriction, that border on what constitutes the us of the United States is in the active process of being negotiated right now as I speak, along the lines of whether we will or whether we will not insist upon the fiction of binary gender being defined as real in terms of American culture. This is a monster discourse. And as in so many cases, the monsters are actually the good guys, highlighting a real and demonstrable deficiency in the status quo. But insofar as monstrous discourse or monster discourse is a type of negotiation, we need to ask how these negotiations are going to be resolved, because ultimately all negotiations are resolved one way or another. So what I'd like to do now is provide the two most extreme possibilities, between which, of course, there is a whole spectrum of other possibilities. One possible resolution is exclusion. This is the route that the Trump administration took relative to trans people serving in the military. It's the route that any privileged group takes in excluding any other group that doesn't share its privilege. Or to broaden the context a bit, it's the route that any group that operates by a defining narrative takes when excluding any group that does not share its particular narrative, be that narrative one of politics, history, gender, race, what have you. But of course, there are questions revolving around 
what that exclusion, what that contraction of the circle actually means, aren't there? When we contract that horizon to exclude the monster, we're engaging in an act of definition or redefinition, depending on circumstances. We're looking at that border figure, that challenge to our categories, and saying, we're going to exclude all of that. That is, anything that fits into that challenging category, we're going to define as being outside of the category that we label as ourselves. That contraction of moral horizons has serious implications, real-world implications, because this is also a contraction of, of empathy, a contraction of recognition of common humanity. That is, the conservative response to the challenge posed by, for example, trans people is to effectively define people who don't fit the binary gender narrative as not entirely human, not as worthy of full consideration, full recognition in our moral community as are people who do buy into that particular narrative. And I'm going to be really honest, I see that option as a moral failure, as a looking of a supposed other in the face and contracting oneself in revulsion, in horror, and in effect, making oneself smaller, making oneself less than one could be in the name of some supposed purity whose reality is really no more than a narrative convention. But then, of course, the monster offers us another option, doesn't it? The option of inclusion, of expanding our moral horizons to include everything that the monster embodies. And this has been the option pursued by Western society generally over the last couple of centuries at least, where the moral horizon, the full recognition of humanity, once accorded only to white men who are also property holders and of noble birth, has been expanded to commoners, to non-white people, to women, and increasingly now towards people who do not fit the binary gender model that is itself a product of particularly the discourse of Abrahamic religion. It's less than 200 years ago that, for example, in the United States, the Dred Scott legal decision quantified the humanity of an African American as being less than the humanity of a white American. It's barely more than 100 years in Canada, Britain, and the U.S. that women have had the right to vote. And in Canada, it's only 61 years since First Nations people have had the right to vote in federal elections. And if we want to follow the gender question through, it is within my lifetime in both Canada and the U.S. that same-sex sex acts have become not illegal. That is, it's only within my lifetime that legal recognition of full humanity, of full agency in every avenue of humanity, has been extended to people of what we might call non-conforming gender. Meanwhile, if you take a look at depictions of, say for example, villains in popular culture from the mid-20th century, many of these characters, I'm thinking of Mr. Cairo from the Maltese Falcon, who sits in his chair stroking his walking stick while talking to Sam Spade, are gay-coded. They're portrayed as being morally monstrous, or their moral monstrosity is attached to a gender monstrosity or a projection of monstrosity in gendered terms. That type of coding is only possible if the negotiation is still in progress. Once the matter's been settled, once the monster has either been excluded or included, it loses its ambiguity and simply becomes a clear case of us or them. Now, as I said, the tendency over the last few centuries has been cumulatively a progressive tendency with, of course, reactionary and regressive stances trying to hold it back every step of the way. But to return to the monster itself, 
our own discomfort with with the figure, the ways in which it seems uncanny or other or unsettling to us, are an indication of where the border of our own moral community lies. If we fully recognize the monster as part of our community, we have no discomfort at all. And in fact, it's not even a monster anymore in the sense that I'm using the term. It's simply a member of us. And if we look at it and see it as something to be kept out, but something that has, that causes no psychological strain on our part, no mixed emotions, no sense of moral dread, but rather simply a sense of there being a threat that needs to be excluded, then I think that indicates moral horizons that are contracted to the point where they also no longer overlap the field, the semantic field of the monster, in which case it's no longer a monster in the sense I'm using the term either. It's simply an other against which we need to contend. But of course, then, any common ground that we may initially have had is utterly lost in that process of definition and moral shrinkage. So it's where those uncomfortable emotions, the sense simultaneously of something being of us but not of us, of making problematic our definition of us, it's there that the monster becomes interesting and psychologically and culturally active. And this, of course, is going to differ from society to society, isn't it? And this, of course, brings us around to one final question of, I guess, what we might call terminology, and that is the word we use to define that border straddling figure doesn't have to be monster, it can also be hero. Heroes typically, classically understood, are also figures that challenge conventional notions of us and them, inside and outside, acceptable and unacceptable. And in this sense, we can maybe take a look at Heathcliff. He is monstrous, but he is also an example of the romantic hero and the Byronic hero. He's the figure on the border from that point of view as well. The one who exemplifies a way of being that is outside the norm, recognizable by the norm, and that may or may not be accepted, but that potentially expands horizons. And the choice to see that border-straddling figure as a hero or a monster is, I think, very much a choice. And it's a choice that comes with ethical implications. Again, the choice to include or exclude that which is, at the point of encounter, clearly of mixed nature. Now, if we turn our attention to the tenant of Wildfell Hall, I'll just close off with a brief comment on that one to lead into a more focused talk tomorrow. And that is, Helen Graham also embodies many of the characteristics of both the romantic and the Byronic hero. She's the dark stranger, but she's a she. This is one of the really interesting things that Anne Bronte is doing with the figure of Helen Graham. She's giving us a female romantic hero, and while the characters in the novel wrestle with her and struggle to get to know her, we can see them discussing her in her absence, pondering her parenting choices, her life choices, what her moral status is, how they should approach her, their attempts to overwrite her own narrative with a narrative of their own. That's how we approach monsters. We try to rewrite them to incorporate them in our narratives, if not in our communities. So in that sense, maybe rather than incorporate, I should say contain. And Helen's resistance to that containment is in many ways, I think, genuinely heroic. And that becomes even more apparent as we move through the narrative. I'm not going to give too much away here. But I would like to leave you with the thought that you can probably get a useful reading of Helen by taking this notion of monstrous discourse to her in roughly the way that I've described it here, but you, of course, will probably have your own ideas too. And seeing how she looks through that particular lens, to my mind, this makes her a compelling and wonderfully engaging character and a really challenging character because she does exist 
in the 1848 when this book was published on the frontiers of society. She is a, a woman with a child living alone with a dubious past, by which I mean an unknown past at the, t at the point of contact, engaging in an occupation that is innately an unstable occupation and clearly hiding from something. So, I think that will be it for now. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this little digression to be insightful, useful, enjoyable. Insert positive adjective here. And I will look forward to talking with you about Tentative Wildfell Hall on Friday. Bye for now.